Okay, can you hear me? All right, here's the deal. We're about to get started. About to get started with the first forum of the calendar year 2019, and it's going to be led by Pete K6BFA. And he's going to talk about some exciting history of this club. This is one historic club. We all know that last year it was 55 years. That's a long time. And there was a lot of stuff that went on during those 55 years, and Pete is going to tell us about some of that. And Yasek, you need a minute to get, don't That's trip anything. Help some of the stuff out of those barrels over there. Yeah, yeah I will. And okay, Pete, I can hear you. That's good. Can you? Okay, well, let's So good. take it over, Pete. Well, thank you very much. Uh, talking with some of the members recently, and we mentioned uh, balloon flights and so on, and I got a blank stare, and I looked around the room, and I saw, boy, a lot of new faces and people that haven't had the excitement of going out and launching a balloon, chasing it across Virginia and uh, D.C. and Maryland, recovering it from, we had eight flights, we recovered it from eight different sites, and they've all been rather, some of them have been rather exciting. I'm going to show you some pictures today and a little short video, and I have the equipment up here, so if you ever want to see what a balloon feels like, because it feels real squishy, it's kind of exciting to take a look at it. <laughs> I'm having lights out up here. Okay, well, let's see what we got here because I put this together kind of fast and so it's not really sequential. But let's see what happens here. All right, this is what, this is what the balloon system looks like. You can see there at the top, I have a, uh, a bag here that has the uh, pointer in it. A cam oh, right there on the end, camouflage bag. It'll be in the outside pocket in a little case there. Thank you. You can see there at the top, obviously, that's the balloon. And Howard will hold up the balloon there for you, which is the end package, kind of a buff colored. Yes. Feel free to come up, look at it, touch it. You can touch it now because that balloon is not going to fly. Uh, if it was going to fly, we would wear rubber gloves. We would keep it pristine. Because if you get any foreign material on it, when it gets up to minus 50, minus 100 degrees, that spot will freeze first and the balloon will burst and then we won't get the uh, altitude that we're hoping to get. So that's, that's the top part of it. It got a little chopped off there. The next important thing to know, and uh, we'll see that in a minute, is what does the FAA say about this stuff? I have a screen coming up, so hold your questions on what the FAA says about it, and we'll take a look at the specs and their requirements and see whether or not we meet that. The next thing that you see down here, right in there, is just a little tag that hooks up to this line, and this is about 20 feet long between there and there, and it hooks up to the top of the parachute, which Howard is displaying for you right now right there underneath the balloon right where it belongs there you got it okay there's a little tag right in the middle just hold that up now when it goes up do we have a line tag to the top there where Howard's holding it with his left hand and then the bottom part of it hooks on to the continuation of this leader that comes on down so when it goes up it's all c collapsed it doesn't you know it's just going up just like he's got it there when it comes down, that's when it deploys and it works itself as a parachute. The important stuff to know is that this line right here has got a 50 pound breaking point. So any pressure above 50 pounds, it will cause it to break. When it breaks, balloon go if something hits it, like for instance, a wing of an airplane or something, which we've never had that yet. It breaks, the balloon goes up, the payload comes down, the parachute deploys, everything happens. We just go out now and try and find it where it is. And then the bottom part is the payload, and Howard will hold up the payload. And this inside of here, if you hold the bottom up, you'll see a black hole. We have a camera that points down. And if you look at the side of it, you'll see there's another black hole on the side, and that camera points out. Inside there, we have our uh, tracking gear. We have the GPS. We have the little two-meter transmitter and it sends out the signal and then we track it using a, uh, 
just like a Google map, you see a little balloon icon on there. If you remember the uh, around the world in 80 days, the nice colorful balloon with a little bucket on the bottom. That's what the icon looks like running across the map, runs across uh, between where we launched it in Strasbourg and where we recovered it in a number of places. Let's take a look and see what we got. Okay, if you notice down in this corner, I don't know if you can see it or not, these are the FAA requirements. Total weight has to be less than six pounds. They projected the uh, payload weight, less the balloon, is no more than four pounds. And uh, it has to have 50 pound test line and no FAA waivers are required if you do this. If you go exceed these, then you have to get a waiver. We've always been within the limits and we've always notified the FAA so they can put it out in their NOTAMs and everybody knows that we're launching it so it's not a big secret. It's just a lot of fun. It's a secret when it lands in your backyard and you're not expecting it. That's where the secret is. So you can get an idea of what the, some of the weights are. Uh, the total weight, let's see, where is it, right? Uh, total weight without the balloon looks like four and a half pounds. And someplace up there I noticed there was, or there's the total, there it is, the payload and the contents, 3.9 pounds. And the total weight, I don't happen to see it immediately, but there it is. There's a, uh, the maximum side of one of the boxes, there's a certain s number of square inches that you could see, then that would be the maximum size. So that's what we launch, and we'll go down here and see what we got. This is some of the information we got back from one of our launches. This is uh, produced from the data that was recovered on the ground as we're chasing across the states. You can see there on the uh, left, that's where it was launched in Strasbourg. We fill the balloon up, we have a weight on the bottom so that we get equilibrium on the ground. So when we release it, it's programmed with the amount of gas that we have in the balloon. So it'll climb at about 1,000 feet a minute. And this particular case, I think this went up to 86,000. The m most we did was 122,000 feet, which is a little over 22 miles. Got up there and it burst and it came on down. Interesting thing is if you look at the the line here as it goes, you can see this is rather constant, rather flat, till it goes up here and it bursts, and then you notice it coming down almost like free fall until it reaches a point about here and then it starts to go down. That free fall point is in fact free fall. It has the parachute on it, but there's no air. So this whole mess just comes dropping on down. There's nothing to cause that parachute to deploy until we reach about, oh, I'm going to guess that's probably around 60,000 feet. And then the parachute deployed right about here, and then we have it adjusted so that it drop, it descends at about 1,000 feet per minute. So if this is 60,000 feet, 1,000 feet per minute, that's a whole hour from the time that it bursts, and we can track it because we get this information in our chase vehicles, and we can track it until it comes down. Interesting thing about this flight, it was built right there. It came down in the tree right there. It just, we launched it, it came down. I was watching it and it just came down and circled right over my house, came on down and landed up in a tree up on uh, one, two blocks away in Church Street. And there it was. It just, you know, it just like it came home. I'm <laughs> watching it come on down and, and there it is outside the window. So that's kind of interesting on that particular one. Let's take a look at, here's, this is a photograph that we took from, uh, I think it says 110,000 feet. And there's the Atlantic Ocean right there. We're over Front Royal. There's the Atlantic Ocean, Chesapeake Bay, Potomac River runs around down here. You can't see that very well, but trust me, the Potomac River is there. And uh, one of the launches we had, I think it was about number seven, took off from Strasburg, Virginia, flew across, lined itself up on the Potomac River. And you know how the jets fly the river? They have the river approach as they fly down. That's what our little balloon did. It just got a, picked up the, the uh, Potomac River over uh, uh, Roslyn, and then it just tracked that river right on down. Here we're, we're looking at the Google map, and we can see this little icon just going right down along the river. And of course, it landed in the river. 
So then we had to uh, go out and start knocking on doors to get a, a kayak. We finally borrowed a kayak from one of the residents that was along where the thing landed. And uh, John Birch jumped in the kayak, pushed him out in the water. He went out and brought this real soaking wet octopus albatross. It was just an ugly, unmanageable piece of rubber. So if you can imagine if you were to stick something like that in a bathtub or a swimming pool, uh, you just have to keep hauling it in, hauling it in. Anyway, we got it back and uh, we're, we're able to cut another recovery. Okay, that's the end of that. Now I've got to t t take a break here for just a moment while I find another uh, one that I want to show you here. Uh, I think this is it. Nope, 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 nope. Let's see here. Mm. File. Well, I had this all organized and now, oh there, I think that's it. We'll try that one there. Okay. Let's see if we can get this here. I may just have you come up and see this stuff in real life. There it is. Okay, something or another drove us out to Strasburg in one of the coldest days of the year. And... Is that loud enough? Lift off. Yeah. <laughs> the reason we're moving so fast is it was so cold. cold. <laughs> now, now put rubber, rubber, rubber gloves, gloves on, on your hands so that you can handle the balloon and it gets even colder. There it is ready to go. Whoop, it's gone. Now these are pictures from the horizontal camera. This is the vertical one. I'll tell you about those balloons in just a minute. If I forget, ask me. Stand by. Not much left of it. So picture that in water, trying to bring that into a little kayak. Notice all the empty spaces, the clear ground there. Lots of places for it to land. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, right, yeah. There's John, I didn't see you earlier. No. Oh, okay. That ladder is superfluous to the whole thing. <laughs> and we recovered another one. Would you read the side of that the sign that's on the side of that box? I think it has the red straps on it. This is supposed to keep people away from being any fear of what it is. There, it's right your right hand. Your right hand. Yeah. Do not open the call the following number. The NOR. <laughs> so if you saw that hanging in the tree, would that make you feel better knowing that it was a harmless experiment? Just fell out of the sky. 
Yeah. Let him, let him read that. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 yes, sir. I'm going to read it again here. I got the mic. It says, harmless. Amateur radio experiment. Do not open. And it gives a phone number. And then it says, Vienna Wireless Society on the side. So if you were a bad guy and you wanted to do something bad, there's a good idea to put that on the side of your container and, and scare everybody away. So that was the one that we recovered. And uh, I'll go a little bit through what it takes to launch this thing. Now, the reason is it's kind of a sales pitch, too. We've run eight of these, and we've had about uh, 12 people that have experience with the balloon launch. So we have to uh, calculate the winds aloft. We have to contact the FAA, we, the uh, National Weather Service. We have, there's all this stuff that has to happen. Uh, we have to build the transmitter, have to get the camera so that it'll trigger the camera, and we have to have a reason for doing the experiment. It costs about $2,000, and most of that is in helium. And the balloon has a fixed price, but the helium, you know, is, uh, there's not a whole lot more helium coming around, so uh, that's where the expense is. We need, if you want, if this sounds interesting, you know, we need to have somebody say, I'm interested in that. And I have a little bit of organizational background. I don't have, I'm not a big electronics guy, but I can organize things. That's the guy we want to organize a telecommunications team, a launch team, a payload design team, uh, a chase team, a launch team. All of these things have to be together. The guy that raises his hands is one that just collects all the names and makes sure it's all there. Then we go down to Strasburg. We'll probably go farther south to around Huntington because that gets us out of the uh, flight paths for the two airports that are up here. And we probably go down farther south, launch the balloon, chase it across, get some exciting movies and films, and everybody can go back and say we had a good time. Used amateur radio communications. So uh, what I'm going to do is just show you a little bit about how this balloon works. And I would encourage you to come up afterwards and feel the balloon. It's real squishy. And you can imagine what John was doing out in the middle of the lake, in the middle of the uh, river, in a canoe or a kayak, I guess it was, trying to bring this whole thing in that's soaked up with water. Pardon me? Uh, about about four hours, four, but each one of them was different. The ones that went up higher was longer, of course, and then the, some. Of the, but they usually last about four hours, maybe up to six hours. Now, the question that you didn't ask is how big did the balloon get when it burst? Well, you saw how big it was when we launched it there. Excuse me just a minute. <coughs> you saw how big it was when we launched it. That's at standard temperature and pressure, 15 pounds per square inch. Now you take it up to where it's, what, 0.15 to the minus 3, I think. Very, very thin. The balloon is going to be probably... Oh, maybe 50 feet in diameter, maybe 100 feet in diameter before it bursts. Somebody with their calculator, get your slide rule out, and we can calculate what the diameter of the balloon is. But thinking about it as uh, standard temperature and pressure, uh, what is it, 68 degrees and 15 pounds per square inch, and then put it up there where it's so much less and it's minus, uh, minus so many degrees. It's going to be huge when it bursts. And then... Uh, down it comes, and you saw what the, the rag looks like there. Well, here's the, would you get me? I do not have that. But when you mention that, pull that PVC out of there, please. When you mention that, that could be very, no, there's another one in there, that the one that uh, Ross was enthralled with. Nope, 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 it's got a, there it is right there. Here it is. <laughs> Whoa, here. <coughs> One of the things that has always intrigued me is to have live, excuse me, uh, live amateur radio broadcast from our payload. And this would be something that I could really get behind and make sure that we threw some money at it to make sure that it worked. But we need, we need this coordinator, the facilitator, that can put all this together. And then he has to put together the team, the person that knows uh, amateur radio video. 
that's going to be one of the teams. Then we're going to have our, tele our uh, tracking team and so on. So we need to put that all together, launch this. Can you imagine live TV from a balloon as it flies through the flight path at Dulles Airport or something? <laughs> you see the passengers in the plane waving at us. No, I try to stay away from that. Okay. This is the this is the device that we use. This is all kind of tied together here. Rip that open there a little bit. Okay. This hooks up to our bottle of uh, helium. This slips over the bottom of the balloon. So just pull that out. I think I see the end of it right there. Right there. All right, just let it go. This is part of it. So this slips over. And one of the things that Ross won at the, uh, so it slips on here. And one of the tools that Ross won at the uh, Christmas party was a roll of duct tape. And about a quarter of a roll of duct tape goes on around here so that we can fill this up, open it up, watch it, wait until it reaches equilibrium so we know that the we have controlled the rate of climb, and then tie this off, all this with rubber gloves on a 20 degree morning in a vacant parking lot. <laughs> that just happens to be what it is when you launch these darn things. Yeah, it's, uh, oh, we've launched a couple of them in the uh, warm weather. But uh, the, uh, some of the places that we found them, well, this, this is one that went, I talked about that landed in uh, Ven Vienna. John was up in the tree with his rope climbers and salvaged that one, pulled one out of the river. And another one, we went went into Maryland through an uh, athletic field where you have all these real tall lights and towers and everything. It just landed underneath an oak tree right on the ground. Just there it was, walked up, picked it up, went home. So sometimes we're lucky, sometimes we're not. Not that, I, not that I'm aware of. Yes? How this thing can be launched around Dulles Airport and Washington National and come down to the Potomac. I mean, I don't understand how they can permit that. Well, first of all, 122,000 feet, it's way above everything. First of all, can you repeat the question, Pete? Because everybody listening may not hear, have heard the question. The question Go ahead. was, Go ahead. How, so, Harry wanted to know, he didn't understand how we can do all this in the airspace that's around Washington, D.C. with Dulles and National and all that sort of thing. And Pete's about to give us the secret answer. The secret answer is it all took place before 9-11. <laughs> now, beyond that, I have no idea what the uh, requirements are. Now, we could, if we want to do this, of course, we're going to have to find a location. And uh, the one, of the one of the teams would develop a cut-down device. So when we're tracking it and it goes someplace we don't want it to, you just push the button and the, it goes up and it cuts the balloon loose and the payload comes down. Yes, sir. So we do back here. Uh, I had oversight. Oh, sorry. Uh, I had oversight over uh, things called uh, radar, uh, Pentagon uh, crash line, E911, and uh, uh, so I just retired from the five-sided building in June. And uh, uh, I have a request uh, for Mark Warner and Jerry Connolly uh, to create a platform for a waiver for drones inside the no-fly zone area. And uh, uh, so uh, if FAA has a process to it, it is not reachable. And uh, considering that I was invited to the Pentagon after 9-11 and did uh, the agencies, the law enforcement agencies' homework that had mandated an anti-terrorism by Congress, uh, I give it uh, a pretty good chance. Uh, that would be law enforcement, public safety, emergency services. Uh, and I did have oversight over the national warning system, which is sort of a FEMA thing. Uh, uh, so I'd be more than happy to add, you know, uh, uh, amateur radio platform for emergency services and use this as a forum for testing for Perfect. communications. All right, okay. so that's an idea. Mr. President. Get his stats, will you? We, we will. We'll do that. And we have five minutes, Mr. Okay. Pete. Yes, sir. Leon. Uh, Go ahead. Could you say just a little bit more about what's in the box? What's in the yeah, box? The um, let's open uh, open one of them. I don't know that there's anything in there. 
nothing in that one. Uh, yeah, it's this one. This is one. This is this is the one here. We have cameras, one that's horizontal, one that's vertical, and we have some kind of timing device that makes it work. In here, we have uh, we have the GP. I don't know if I can if you can see this or not. We have the GPS receiver, and we have the two meter. Is this? I think this is the two meter two meter transceiver that puts out the signal. Of course. When it's at 100,000 feet, line of sight is nothing. You can, you know, get by with very little power. I think this one also has, uh, there's another one that I had here that had the antenna. Uh, it just had a, a J-pole that was hanging down from it. Is that it? This one, yeah. yeah, it just had a regular J-pole that was hanging down from it. And pretty light, you know, four pounds. Yes, uh, Why, why can't you use cloth gloves if it's cold? Use what? Cloth gloves. Okay. Keep going. Uh, okay. Well, one was um, I thought that uh, civilian GPSs would not work at very high altitudes. We didn't have a problem. Okay. The, uh, the second was uh, why, why couldn't you use clean cloth gloves? Uh, well, you need to have a barrier so that n nothing, you know, moisture from your skin could penetrate the cloth, I guess. Uh, oh, sorry, I should say dry cloth gloves. <laughs> okay, well, they might not be dry when you start to handle it. The and rubber and gloves, there's no question. And, and, my, and my third question is, um, could you save money by using natural gas instead of helium? You only get half the lift, but if it costs less than half as much, it's a win. Well, you take a bigger balloon to get the same payload. Uh, we, we've never had to have that problem yet because we've always had enough money and enough helium available that we've been able to launch with helium. So to answer your question, I don't know because it, it's never been a problem up to this point. Yes? Uh, instead of helium, uh, what about hydrogen? Uh, in <laughs> yes, I know that the, uh, the hydrogen took out the Hindenburg, but uh, you don't have passengers on this site. But it's not commercially available. Not for this, not for purposes. No. Okay, that answers that question. We've never, we've never faced it before, so it's a question that we've never had to ask. But the helium has always, always been there. It's always worked very well. Okay, folks, thanks to Pete. Don't uh, fail to go feel the uh, <laughs> equipment there. But it's time for us to have a little social hour or a half hour or 20 minutes. It's now 7.30. Uh, we're going to recommence at uh, 10 minutes until 8, 7.50. So please enjoy. By the way, the food that tonight is being uh, provided by our wonderful uh, social food team. And KM4JOA, Kurt, is the guy who did it tonight. So thank you, Kurt. <laughs>